Yeah, I think we are live now. Yeah, uh, Sumesh, can, can you please check with uh, uh, Mahesh Chandra to see whether uh, Partham Mazumdar can be uh, helped to come online? In yeah, he's online. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, we are able yeah, to I'm, hear I'm, I'm extremely sorry I was uh, mute, uh, muted and I wasn't able to unmute myself. And I'm not starting my video primarily because right now I'm operating from a, from a place where uh, the, the bandwidth is really low, so I had problems getting into. Um, anyway, let me first uh, express on behalf of the uh, entire Academy of Indian Academy of Sciences, our deepest uh, gratitude to Professor Manu Prakash for uh, kindly agreeing to, um, you know, um, give this talk. And it's uh, really almost three hours there uh, in California. So we are really grateful to you, Professor Prakash, uh, that you are, um, you know, willing to give this Frontiers of Science uh, lecture. Uh, we know that you work in the Frontiers of Science, uh, and therefore uh, this lecture is absolutely wonderful that you can give this uh, Frontiers of Science lecture. For uh, those of us who uh, may not know about the Indian Academy of Sciences, uh, for those in the audience who may not know about the Indian Academy of Sciences, uh, we are um, one of the three national academies of sciences. And uh, this was founded in 1934 by Sir C.B. Raman. Um, we, um, on behalf of all of the three academies, we promote uh, um, science among uh, scientific temper, um, you know, various kinds of scientific uh, engagements uh, uh, with um, starting from the school children and going up to the university level. So across the entire spectrum of education, we actually promote scientific temper and scientific education. Non-formal education, we don't get into the classrooms, but we do, um, students do projects with our fellows and so on and so forth. Uh, we also have a, an academy trust where we, uh, the Indian Academy of Sciences essentially is uh, a body of higher learning, but we also promote um, you know, scientific temper, etc. in among school children. Uh, we have a strong outreach program and that's done through the academy trust, um, which is really privately funded. Uh, and we raise funds from various uh, sources and we carry out these outreach programs. During this period, it's been a little difficult for us because most of our uh, outreach programs have been through um, online versions, but usually we go out to the schools and colleges and universities and engage ourselves in these uh, activities that we do. We also publish a large number of scientific journals and our uh, journals are um, internationally renowned. So without further ado, essentially what, what we do is uh, we recognize science, we promote science, we promote scientific temper and culture. This is what the Indian Academy of Sciences does. And uh, we have initiated uh, this year uh, a lecture series called Frontiers of Science, and we are um, inviting um, really people who work in the frontier areas of science. And you, we will, we are eager to hear a talk by Professor Manu Prakash, and we are uh, ab absolutely, um, you know, grateful that he can engage with us, uh, even though it's uh, almost uh, midnight or past midnight there in California. So, Professor Prakash, without uh, taking more time, thank you very much. One more time, and uh, I will hand over the podium to uh, Professor Naren, who will uh, introduce you and conduct the rest of the session. I hope that you will be able to take a few questions and answer uh, questions uh, at the end. And uh, Professor um, Naren uh, will actually uh, conduct the rest of the program. So, once again, thank you very much on behalf of the Academy. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Partha. So let's begin. Uh, good morning to uh, everyone uh, who's in India right now and uh, for people out there in the US, uh, good evening. 
Uh, it's really a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Manu Prakash. Uh, it's actually quite a, a task because Manu wears many hats. He's an engineer, physicist, biologist, uh, very colorful background. He's a BTEC from IIT Kanpur in computer science. And after his PhD uh, at MIT uh, from the Media Lab, Media Arts and Sciences with Professor Neil Gershenfeld in Applied Physics and Fluid Dynamics. I remember uh, reading a very interesting paper from uh, Manu Prakash uh, from his PhD days on microfluidic uh, bubble logic, which had come in science. Uh, and since then, he, uh, he moved on to uh, Harvard uh, as a postdoc fellow, as a fellow. And uh, since 2011, he has been at Stanford. Uh, and uh, he runs a lab which is called, uh, I mean, it's curiosity driven lab in the bioengineering department. And he's associated with many centers, many departments in Stanford and NGOs across the world. Uh, he's a true polymath and expert in many topics. Uh, and uh, uh, it shows up in the range of courses he teaches and the eclectic mix of graduate students from various disciplines. Uh, so I had the opportunity to visit his lab and his mentorship was on display when I interacted with his group. Uh, one thing that needs to be mentioned is he has really championed uh, the concept of access to science and is continuously in the process and a mission to democratize experimental learning and participation. And in this journey, he has uh, come up with uh, very interesting scientific toys, the full scope and paper future. He's the co-founder of Foldscope Instruments uh, uh, and is a, a known for his prolific beta testing. You should see many of his posts in his community blog, Microcosmos, or follow his uh, Twitter feed. Uh, he shares a passion which is really infectious and he needs to be heard. Uh, so we are very glad to have him deliver this public lecture. Uh, my neuroscience colleagues are quite curious with the title, uh, Neuroscience Without Neurons how mechanics encodes behavior in, in neural system. So over to you, Manu. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, please, uh, uh, for all the listeners, we have both uh, WebEx and uh, uh, YouTube platforms. So if you are on the WebEx, please use the question answer uh, box. Uh, I'll also pick up questions from the chat, but Q&A is preferred. Uh, for the uh, people on YouTube, you can use the uh, comments or chat box there or email me if it's a long question or something which uh, you want to ask in detail, email me at narayan at the rate jncsr.ac.in. So over to you, Manu. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, it's absolutely a delight to be here. I wish I could be there in person. Uh, I have never visited uh, JNCSR, but I've heard quite a lot about it. And also just the community in general, it's been a pretty tough time for all of us, the sense of isolation. And we all know academia works by sharing ideas. So I'm really glad it's a little bit late. I haven't slept for a couple of days because of just the <laughs> what's happening with work here and COVID. I'm actually still in the lab right now. So uh, from a timing point of view, it's not so bad after all. Um, I think uh, what I wanted to do today was since I knew a breadth of community would join both from biology, physics uh, and mathematics uh, to give you a flavor of the kinds of questions we're interested in and share a few sets of ideas that I'm excited about. Uh, but most importantly, share some philosophical underpinnings of how we choose problems and why we think these problems are important. Uh, you can interrupt me with questions on the side and uh, I'll try to leave some time for questions so we can really make it a little more interactive. Uh, so to begin, the the lab to me has been driven by uh, questions we ask. Uh, it's a community. Uh, I really cherish uh, the students that I get a chance to engage with. Uh, several of the students uh, who have spent time in uh, scientific communities at Bangalore have then uh, gone on to come and spend some time in my lab. So I'm actually quite uh, thrilled and excited about uh, hosting many of the students. Uh, and, you know, this cartoon really describes the scatterbrand nature of uh, our own work. Uh, 
Um, I tried to weave in a theme today. You'll see some of the, the links there. But on the other hand, I should just be upfront. Uh, many of the questions we ask are loosely connected with each other, but we are deeply interested in them for their own sake. Uh, you know, you shouldn't try to pick up too much of a theme in this talk. Um, and then the other aspect of this is, you know, these people are real and uh, just it's an absolute privilege as scientists to get a chance to work with young people. I spend a lot of time uh, with my students, uh, both in the lab and in the field, and you will see how that interacts in the types of questions that we pick. Uh, and I'm actually quite uh, humbled by the fact that we can get some of this work funded because sometimes uh, when we begin, we don't really know what we are doing uh, and uh, to be supported in the context of a curiosity driven approach is very important. Uh, so I did not know how to begin a talk uh, to such a breadth of an audience, uh, and especially when I'm so tired and it's uh, uh, so late at night. And I decided to start with, uh, you know, sharing two of my favorite books. You might be surprised or not surprised. They happen to be children's books. And I want you to remind, just as a reminder, why we do science to begin with. Uh, one of them is a book that I got to my three-year-olds. Uh, it's called The Wonders of Nature. It's a golden book. And it just primarily asks questions. And I'll actually read a few things. It's uh, when I open it after a couple of pages, it talks about, isn't it a wonder that some seeds have wings? and some have tiny silicon parachutes. Um, uh, isn't it a wonder that animals under the uh, water are called sea anemones, sea lilies, and sea cucumbers, and sea grapes are all animals? Um, and one of the things about this uh, book and the faces that you see here is just a sense of awe that we are all born with uh, when we think about observing this world that we inherit and we take so much for granted often enough. Um, and to me, this captures uh, and these sets of ideas capture the notion of how curiosity drives much of uh, the questions that we are all capable of asking and ask. And how do you pursue those sets of passions uh, in different directions? And I think today you'll see an inkling of many of these, but the origin stories of all the questions and ideas that I'll talk about are embedded in this uh, this context of asking simple questions uh, about what we can observe. Uh, another context to my second favorite book, uh, and it is again another book in biology, uh, is a book called The Golden Book of Biology. Uh, and this one is, uh, it's it's deeper in its uh, writings. It's not really written just for children. But one of the big things I want to remind everybody here in the community, which this book highlights truly for me, is the idea that sometimes when we are thinking about biological questions, we often limit ourselves to the five or six handful of species that have been studied extensively. And the fact that there is, you know, 10 million or so species on planet Earth and just the true diversity of biology uh, often begs a question that for any set of idea or uh, things that you're thinking about, there might be out there just the perfect species for you to ask those questions. And how do you discover and find that system to study is, uh, is an art, uh, but on the other hand, uh, if you just look at uh, these sketches, it should remind you uh, that truly uh, the biodiversity on this planet is both completely understudied and at that same time, it has not been utilized in a manner to ask the kinds of questions. And you'll see throughout the talk, I will invoke uh, observations and ideas from all kinds of phylas of biology. So let's begin with a single question. Uh, which is a tough one to answer and again uh, alludes to the title of my talk. Uh, very broadly, we're interested in how biological systems embody computation. How do they embody behavior? And I have a particular meaning in mind when I think about embodiment. And I am going to limit myself to a neural systems. And what I mean by that is uh, 
trying to ask a simpler question, which is biological systems show immense complexity. Behavior is an outcome of that complexity. But what if before beginning to understand the complex uh, nervous systems that give rise to behaviors like me waking up in late at night and giving this talk, uh, what can we say about systems that do not have that architecture? So much of what I will talk about are systems that don't have neurons but have complex behavior. And we will try to explore uh, how to try to ask some very simple ways of trying to understand the emergence of that behavior. And again, you know, I am in awe of my neuroscience colleagues. I sit across a, the neuroscience building uh, in their endeavor to tackle, you know, one of the most complex biological matter that has ever been created. But in the end, I also think about a value in thinking about types of systems and how they would embody computation if you did not have the framework of neurons. And this is a very difficult question to ask because you might always wonder what is computation to begin with and what does it mean in these biological systems? And I will primarily try to understand observations of living systems and see can physical ideas teach us something about these living systems? So for most of the neuroscientists in the crowd, this is a very common framework. But for the non-neuroscientists, you can think about this in the context of Mars level of analysis, where whenever you're asking these sets of questions, you can ask them at different levels. You can ask them in the context of the hardware that you're going to implement it in, the algorithm that might be under play, and what is the actual computation that happened in these biological systems. And I'll give very specific examples to what I mean by this. So let's begin, and uh, I'm going to jump. Uh, let me just uh, mention a word about the fact that, uh, of course, uh, the ideas of computation, and I personally got started in these questions from much more traditional computers and uh, beginning with, could you embody computation in fluids? And of course, fluids are not living, but the paper that Narayanan had mentioned got me started in thinking about how do you really ask and embody computation in systems like uh, Newtonian fluids, for example. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how that works, but we have spent a lot of time thinking about abiotic systems. And the one I do want to spend time on is this is just a teaser, but I want to remind you that sometimes even with the simplest system that you begin with, some really remarkable behavior arises. So I'm going to play this video. What you're about to see is literally food coloring something that you can find in your kitchen that is used to paint food and add color to it. I've taken a glass slide that I've cleaned and I will let this video play for a second. This is just green food coloring with some Sharpie marks and you start seeing something quite interesting. Uh, what you notice is that these little colored drops of fluid seemingly are talking to each other. Firstly, they're motile. They exhibit uh, uh, immense complexity in the hydrodynamics flow patterns that exist. Uh, I'm not going to try to get into the mechanism. Many of you might have already started thinking about it. Uh, but the thing that I want you to notice is what these droplets do, which is two of them sitting right next to each other can chase and attract. They have a sense of self. Uh, they can detect each other. And again, this is as simple as it can be. It is uh, the unique aspect of these droplets that these are binary droplets. So they are made of miscible fluids that have two fluids uh, that are miscible that have a different vapor pressure and a different surface tension. And you might ask a very simple question. If I could put these two droplets a few centimeters apart, how could they talk to each other? It's very clear that in this system, these droplets are communicating. Uh, and interestingly, sometimes they don't even, of course, you can see up on the top panel that they are communicating and they can attract each other. But interestingly, they can also see a mirror image of themselves uh, in a, on a wall. So for example, they can see themselves on a wall when there is only a single droplet. And this is just a teaser. I just wanted to remind everybody that in simple abiotic systems, as uh, when I think about this, 
Uh, this system is an example of uh, a non-living system that demonstrate chemotaxis. The idea, which is very common in biology, that gradients of a given uh, information that is emitted by a single organism can be detected or a source of food, for example, can be detected by another living organism. But in this situation, there is nothing living. Uh, these sets of systems are active because of the dynamics of evaporation in this system. And uh, of course, there is a lot of work that we have done in this system, but I just wanted to leave it as a teaser for some of you who might not have seen it. Uh, very recently, we have started to explore the limits of complexity in that system by literally having hundreds of these droplets talk to each other. So many of you who study spin glass systems and uh, magnets might find this interesting, uh, where instead of now studying interactions of a few, uh, I'm studying essentially around 100 droplets on a lattice, and you're starting to see that they're talking to each other, they're interacting with each other, there is a periodicity in the system, we can drive and pump energy in the system. But we're interested in understanding if these systems can form patterns. Uh, and again, remarkably, these are the kinds of systems that have been extensively studied in physics. Uh, one very interesting thing about presenting this type of uh, frustrated system in fluids is the fact that you can observe, you can observe every single state and there are certain properties and parameters that we can model explicitly. Uh, but I think this was a teaser. Uh, I wanted to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, as you're thinking about these types of systems, uh, I want to start with the simplest possible systems. So I demonstrated to you that uh, some really remarkable uh, abiotic systems can have complex behavior. But what I'm really interested in is understanding uh, complex behavior in living systems uh, that are seemingly simple. So I'm going to show you a video now of a protist, which is a single cell. This is another cell that we work on. And there is something quite remarkable about this video that you're watching. Here is a single cell that I actually picked from a pond uh, in the spirit of wonders of nature. Uh, I, there is a swamp that I visit every so often and I found the cell in that swamp. Uh, if I had not told you uh, that this organism that you're watching is a single cell, you might have thought that this could be a worm. Uh, I mean, it has a head, it has a tail, and it's demonstrating here is a search behavior. It is searching for food. Uh, and we actually study the search dynamic to try to understand how can the single cell uh, with, uh, I mean, of course, with the immense complexity of a cell, uh, make these classes of decisions to literally uh, change its shape. This is real time. The video that you're watching is in real time, uh, completely dynamically control its degrees of freedom. You can think of this as a neck and a head and still seemingly hunt. And we study this hunt dynamics. Uh, another example that I want to show uh, in the spirit of what I will talk about quite a lot uh, is now switching from a single cell to a multicellular system. This is another system that we study uh, in our lab extensively. Uh, and I'm going to play this video. And I think uh, you know, no matter what, I just want you to first appreciate these observations because to me, what's far more important is uh, you know, being able to be lost in these biological data sets. Uh, so remarkably, what you're watching here are little blobs of cells. Uh, now, every one of these uh, little blobs is essentially a clonal animal that is on a Petri dish. You can see the best way to observe this video is just observe one of the cell uh, clusters of cells, which would be one animal. And something quite surprising appears in this data set. Uh, what you find is we often think about animals with stereotypical shapes and forms, and it turns out here there is no stereotypical shape. Uh, you also find something quite remarkable where there is a sense of a periodicity in motility that you will actually see. There is interaction. Uh, 
And again, you know, going from the droplets and the kind of chaos that I showed you, you can start extending your imagination and ask, how could a cluster of cells do this? And interestingly, uh, to be true to the title of the talk, uh, the system that you're observing is a multicellular animal with no neurons. And hence, we ask this question of how is behavior encoded in a sheet of cells, for example? Uh, so, you know, before we begin, uh, I want to give a slight uh, context to this problem, uh, which is, uh, this is an age old problem, uh, because we know and understand if you think about the evolution of the neuron itself, uh, you might ask, uh, where did neurons come from? These are fairly complex cells that have the capacity to communicate long distance, really fast communication, very complex geometries. But, you know, there must be an evolutionary pre-step. Uh, and interestingly, uh, if you start asking a question of life before a neuron, there are very few animals uh, that we have good fossil records for because when the Cambrian explosion happened, we had majority of the phylas that existed at that time had neurons. But there must have been a time at the transition of origins of multicellularity to the origins of complexity in the animal tree of life, where there might have been organisms that were just like clusters of cells. And a fundamental question that we are trying to answer, and again, we don't have the answers for it as yet, is in these systems in which only local communication is enabled, how does computation scale as a function of size of the organism? How do I think about cell as a computational resource, just like whenever we go out there and you buy a eight core processor or a 16 core processor, you know you're getting something more. Does that actually work out that if I have a cluster of cells and I just have the same number, same type of cell, but in a larger cluster, could it do and demonstrate behavior that are more complex? And ironically, I don't believe we understand this in a neuronal context. Is a bigger brain better? Do we actually understand how the, comp the complexity of computation that a neural system can accomplish as a function? We, of course, know that it's the circuit complexity that matters. But I'm trying to ask even a simpler question and especially interested in how would you even pose that question? So uh, this is sort of a spirit of the types of questions we will be asking. Uh, and I'm going to now jump back and forth. Uh, let me share a quick story about a discovery that we have made recently that allows us to understand encoding of computation in these aneuronal systems. And I'm going to quickly switch to several other systems because I want to give you a flavor of this work uh, rather than dive in into a single system. So let's begin with the first system. Uh, uh, the system that we study in our lab are called Placozoa. Uh, 10 years ago when I started my lab, uh, you know, just like I go spend time in the in swamps and ponds, I also spend time in libraries. And I was trying to ask a very simple question. Can I pick and find animals that still exist on this planet Earth today uh, that are bona fide animals, that do, they do not have a unicellular lifestyle. So these are not, uh, say, dictostilium or uh, slime mold, which have a unicellular lifetime life cycle. I'm interested in organisms that are bona fide animals that do not have a unicellular life form, but are aneural. So when you go back into the tree of life, you can find, of course, sponges, which we all know uh, don't have any bona fide neurons, and then the other phyla that has no neurons are placozoa. And one of the things that we started working in the system is uh, uniquely from the context of uh, its uh, geometry, which will become uh, clear in a second. So it happens to be an organism that is around. We actually go out to the field. Uh, and remarkably, we find the first surprise which is uh, unlike many of developmental biologists in the crowd, we often think about animal shape to be a fixed final form. We find that this animal seemingly has no fixed shape or form. You know, it's a headache to developmental biologists, but on the other hand, it provides us the first clue of what I was looking for in a system, which could be fungible, where I could add 
size and size of the organism as a resource and ask these sets of questions of how does behavioral complexity scale? So it meets that criteria. You're seeing here clonal animals that show an immense diversity in size and form. Now, uh, the way we work is we actually go trap these animals around the world. Uh, they are minuscule. We put these traps out and we search and we have multiple strains that we maintain in the lab so we can do some comparative biology. Uh, it's tedious work, but you know, just we enjoy it because it gives us a reference to be thinking about. So I'm going to now play that same video that I showed before, and we will be focused on motility. What you're watching uh, is you would be surprised that they have many different shapes and forms. And I think one of the aspects of this is that we have an entire genome and transcriptome. And it turns out, other than one single parasite, these organisms have the smallest gene any known metazoan. And ironically, compared to many different cell types, there are only five or six known cell types. So it is hinting towards the simplicity that we were after. And interestingly, for the biologist in the crowd, he has a system that has no anterior posterior symmetry breaking. Uh, there is a top and a bottom. There is dorsal ventral symmetry breaking, but absolutely no known anterior posterior symmetry breaking, implying that the system has no head or tails. So the system has to dynamically orient and break symmetry, which will become uh, very important uh, very soon. So let's watch, what do I mean by complex behavior? So this is uh, watching this animal over long periods of time. You notice this remarkable behavior. What you just watched is a single animal. It's as if my left hand and my right hand decided to say, we don't want to be together anymore, and they walked away. And if they walked away, they would rip themselves apart. And for a dynamical system to be able to do that without a central pattern generator and without a central controller is quite interesting. So we're interested in, you know, I, I alluded towards droplets. Uh, just imagine watching active droplets splitting themselves apart. Uh, this is far more complex, of course, uh, but how do we understand these types of behaviors? So this is just one example of many behaviors that we study. Uh, so I'm going to now give a little prelude to mechanics. Uh, and uh, for many of the physical biologists or physicists in the crowd, they will find this interesting. To understand the geometry of the system, uh, often enough, the way we study this is in the context of flatland. So if you were to deflate a beach ball, imagine a beach ball that you had, and you took all the air out, the ball will compress and collapse, and the top and the bottom will collide to essentially form a closed epithelial sheet, epithelial sheet implying a layer of cells that have now collapsed on itself, and it forms literally a 20 to 25 micron thin piece of tissue. That's it. So when I do a cross section, you can see different layers of cells at the bottom, different layers of cells at the top. But remarkably, here is a system or an organism that's only 20 to 25 microns thin, but it lives in the ocean. It actually handles the kind of shear strains that you might actually see in the ocean, including, say, waves passing by. And uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. How can a system mechanically actually endure the kind of forces and survive. And so we started asking these questions and we made several discoveries, which I'll very briefly allude to, but then I wanna get back to where does that motile behavior come from? The first system that we discovered uh, in this is the world's fastest actomyosin contraction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a movie. I have made a kind of a microscope that tracks this moving organism. So you can actually watch single cells and you will see this fireworks of activity. Now this activity is not electrical activity. This is essentially contractile activity. It's associated with calcium dynamics, but what you're watching is a fluorescent dye. And when a cell contracts, you see a peak in fluorescence because the total number of molecules in that membrane is constant but they are in a smaller area and it flashes. So you could see this burst of activity. If you track it for long enough, you can watch activity waves that are traveling. 
Now, this is akin to an active solid where a contractile activity wave propagates and bounces around. And many of you who think about active matter should suddenly start thinking about here is an active solid in which the stress and strain of motility somehow induces a contractile pattern. But because if one cell will contract, you will essentially have an extension on your neighboring cells. You can see that this mechanical information can actually propagate. And we will think a lot about this mechanical information in the system in a second. You can also think of these as you know elastic waves propagating, but in an active solid. Now, an interesting anecdote to the side is the fact that we discovered this to be the world's fastest actomyosin contraction known to date. Uh, it's actually not so clear why this is so fast. So a single cell is from a time scale perspective contracting in a few seconds. And when you compare this to many other contractions, you actually find uh, this is the fastest known contraction in a single cell uh, for um, metazoans. So now if you were to ask mathematically what might be going on, I'm going to show a very simple in, in silico model and I am brushing over many of the details because I want to cover up many things. But you can write down a kind of a very simple uh, system in which I can induce a contraction based on say a stress or strain at a peak value. And when you do something like that, you can generate activity waves. You can generate certain kinds of elasticity uh, and these waves can propagate. We can write down analytically what speeds they propagate. But there is something very interesting that we started thinking about here, which is quite non-intuitive. We asked ourselves this question, why on earth would this system have these waves of propagation and so much activity? And we realized that a system like this, which is active, has cohesion or strength uh, that is higher from a rupture perspective only because of its activity. So you can think on the left, what you're watching is a simple piece of rubber. If you stretch a piece of rubber, you will see the strain will distribute, there will be peak strains. And you can imagine and ask that if a peak strain goes above a certain strength in a cell-cell junction, you might find a rupture. But what we find is in this active elastic solid, where there are these waves that are propagating, primarily because of the force that you're inputting on this system, the peak strain is suppressed because of the propagation. Of course, the average strain on all the cells is higher because of activity. And somehow, in a very interesting context, this actual activity gives rise to a rupture-resistant material, a material that can inhibit rupture to a certain extent. Uh, this was work done uh, with my postdoc, uh, Shaha Farman, who's now at the Weizmann Institute. Uh, interestingly, now when you ask yourself this question and take this to the next level, is this actually true that if the system is rupture resistant, how on earth will it split itself apart? And uh, the answer lies in the fact that it's rupture resistant to a certain limit until it actually fractures. And so many of you who think about material fractures, I'm going to play this video one more time. You're watching a biological tissue undergo motility and literally in a fraction of a few seconds rip itself apart. You see that big giant hole. There's a hole in the uh, epithelium at this point and you wait a few, literally a few minutes later and that hole has healed. So that's a quite surprising as a material property for a material to both rupture and be able to heal. So we started studying these fractures and this was work with another one of my postdocs, uh, Vivek Prakash, who now has his lab uh, in Florida. And what we discovered are semblances of fracture dynamics in biological tissues. Before this epithelial uh, it was not shown in a physiological setting that epithelial itself can have catastrophic rupture. But what we find is that these ruptures have a certain coalescence dynamics, and that coalescence dynamics leads to finite scale of these ruptures. But over time, these ruptures can actually heal. And one way that we map this is we can tag and we apply many classical 
fluid mechanics tricks to be able to map this and we can find that there is a matching between the maximum strain fields that we see and where we actually see the ruptures, which is fairly intuitive if you think about uh, how the peak strain is distributed in the system. But more interestingly, uh, something that's quite unique in this system is the fact that we can find different modes. We can find a shear mode of this rupture and we can find a tension mode. Uh, of course, there are no out of plane bucklings in the system. Uh, and what we can actually do is we can model this to try to understand the phase space of what would be the cell adhesion properties that could give rise to this remarkable, highly, uh, uh, in some sense, brittle biological material in a certain phase space uh, and highly ductile biological material in another phase space. So when we run these sets of parameters, we can essentially demonstrate that given the cell adhesion parameters, we are able to phase transition from a ductile material to a brittle material. And what's interesting about this is from a biological perspective, you want to be able to build a piece of tissue that can both give up when it needs to and then heal while also deform and yield when it needs to, to be able to change shape. And um, one of the aspects of this is this phase transition has many interesting parameters that we can draw upon, which tell us the values associated with cell cell adhesion. And then we can run experiments biologically to perturb that cell adhesion, to allow the organisms or our biological experiment to hop from one portion in the face space to another portion in the face space. So this is a fairly malleable property of biological tissue. And I find it quite remarkable because often enough in adult organisms, for example, if I think of my skin and many of our organs in our body, like our lungs, if they were malleable to this extent, just because I'm breathing or I'm stretching too much, you might find a skin hanging here. That does not happen. And that's primarily because of extracellular matrices. Interestingly, in many of these animals, and especially divergent animals, the extracellular matrix is either not there or very minimal. And hence, the material properties that you see are only associated primarily by these cell-cell junctions and the cellular properties. Unlike a higher organism like us, where we are looking at this, I'm literally watching a lot of mechanical property that could be associated with the ECM. So that's all I wanted to say about the mechanics, but let's jump into talking about motility, because I had promised to you uh, this notion of how dynamics can give rise to motile behavior. And uh, this is unpublished work. We are just writing this up. Uh, but one of the aspects of this was we started asking ourselves a simple question. How does a system like this move? And of course, the first thing you do is you observe. And what we find is that these trajectories are fairly complex. And we would like to understand what aspects of the dynamical system actually encodes these trajectories. Uh, and, you know, when you dig in deeper, you find the first interesting surprise, uh, which is when we map these kinds of behavior, we see them in two simple states. One is this rotational state where the entire system is rotating, as you can see on the left. And the other is this translation state where it ran away. And a complex behavior is a combination of rotational and translational states. So this would be a very simple juxtaposition. But now the question is, what encodes this behavior? Uh, how does this organism know what to do and what governs it? So the first thing you do is you look at the belly of the system. So we essentially do electron microscopy. And we find that the organism is coated with millions and millions of cilia. So cilia are a remarkable organelle, and for many of the fluid mechanicians in the crowd, we have often associated with cilia associated with fluid flows. I'm going to show you today a completely unique function of cilia that to my best of my knowledge has actually not been studied, which is walking. And so when I showed you this at the bottom of the, uh, we realized that the animal is covered with cilia, so we spent several years to try to build an imaging system that allows us to watch this live organisms crawling 
in cross section. And what you're going to watch, uh, you know, I, I get goosebumps every time I watch this video. You are watching an individual animal literally walk with millions of cilia. And the definition of walking is the fact that these cilia are directly interacting with a substrate. They are making a conformal contact and they have a gait that looks like legs that are walking. And we can get into that. I'm not going to have enough time to talk about that. Uh, but one of the remarkable features of this is, so if you had a million legs, how would you control them? And if you had a million legs and no brain, how would that system work? Where is the coordinator? How would you coordinate that activity? And remember, many of these cilia are beating between 5 to 15 hertz. So this is a dynamical system that's quite fast. Uh, one of the things, uh, I'm going to skip some of the details here. Uh, the first thing that we did is we actually built a mathematical model that allows us to write down a dynamical system of cilia as an oscillator in conformal contact with substrates. And we can show that these types of systems have a bifurcation, that they can lead to a walking gait naturally, which is different from the gate that is shown, for example, in fluid flow. But this is the most remarkable aspect of this system. When we observe these cilia from the bottom, which is what you're seeing on the left, I'm going to play that just one more time. Uh, some of you might have noticed it. You are seeing a vortex. Millions of these cilia are organizing around a defect, and that defect is propagating. And this is if you are thinking about bird flocks, you know, you're not alone. Of course, bird flocks, the complexity is there is a brain that every bird has, and they're making decisions, observing the behavior of their neighbors to really be able to correlate how they would move. Unlike in a cilia, all there is is essentially springs and pots because these cells are connected to each other. So how on earth is coordination arising in these cilia at massive scale? I mean, we're literally talking about millions of cilia coordinating. So I'm going to play this video one more time because this is my favorite video. And uh, if you didn't, uh, I just want you to appreciate it. I've slowed it down. I'm imaging these cilia by a pseudo turf technique so we can truly observe the contact point. And unfortunately, this video is stalling. So you don't get to see it in its full glory. Let me try if I Okay, that's much better. So I hope you can all see uh, there is the defect. I'll point this defect, and that defect is actually diffusing. And so many of you who study defect dynamics and active matter would immediately uh, uh, understand the context behind this, that this defects is diffusive. And when this rotational def defect essentially hits the boundary, the organism transitions from a rotational state to a translational state. And another way of thinking about this is essentially a translational state is a defect at infinity. So now uh, this begs a question of uh, what is coordinating this activity. And uh, since I'm running out of time, I'm going to go much faster. Let me just write down a mathematical description for this. So first of all, again, this spin wave is propagating across the animal for this coordination to happen. When we measure its velocities, it turns out no classical biological parameter can explain the propagation of this spin wave. The only two things that could explain the fast speed of the spin wave propagating, which is an orientation wave, is either the elasticity in the system, so it's an elastic wave, or essentially neuronal transmission, but we don't have any neurons. There are no uh, electrical activity that's propagating across, so we started thinking about mechanics. And we wrote down the simplest possible mathematical model that you can imagine. Imagine you are sitting on caster wheels that are connected with springs. But now these are interesting caster wheels. We will add energy to them in which the caster wheels have motors in them so they can inject energy. And of course, I just demonstrated that because the cilia can change orientation, there is a rotational degree of freedom at the base of the cilia, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and the rest of it is is just the elastic energy because some of the energy from this activity can be stored in density fluctuations in the tissue. 
So we can write this down in a fairly simple manner. And one of the contexts of this is we write this as a context of an active elastic sheet. There are several sets of things that have been done mathematically like this in active matter. And one of the perspectives for us is we are able to recapitulate these classes of models and literally map them to a biological system. So I'm just going to show you a few simulations of what happens when I write down a dynamical system like this. So first of all, if I write down a dynamical system like this, I randomize all the spins. You notice that they quickly start orienting. They kick out the defects. And now I'm in a Goldstone mode where I've locked an orientation. And now this animal will walk in this orientation forever. Now, uh, I mean, order is good. But on the other hand, that's not what the organism does. The organism has a very complex dynamics. And this is a very boring outcome that everything just aligns and that's not what we are looking for. So clearly something is missing. And we started thinking about the role of noise and height in this system. And we rewrote these sets of equations now, including several other complexities, including height fluctuations, because height fluctuations decouple those cilia. Because this is a 20 micron tissue, you can imagine from a elastic uh, bending dynamics, you can write that. And what you also notice was that similar kind of a behavior of that vortex dynamics. And then the last thing we include in the model is noise, which is associated with the adhesion state, where the cilia itself can either bind or not bind. And when we do that, we find something quite remarkable. Just with these sets of parameters, just the elasticity in the system, activity in the cilia, and noise in adhesion energy to a substrate, we can encode a complex trajectory of millions of these cilia. So what you're seeing on the left is the red mark is the trajectory of these clusters of cells that are now moving. The color code is the strain energy. And the way I think about this is essentially the ciliary activity, which is at a high frequency, injects and stores energy in the elastic modes. And those modes are effectively slightly longer term because you're pumping energy both in higher modes and lower modes. And you can think of it as almost as a memory in the system because these compression waves last longer and effectively they have a longer time impact. And both of these systems go back and forth to give rise to a fairly complex crawling dynamics of this organism in a zero information environment. So most importantly, I have not added any sensory input to the system. So this is quite a fun result because in now we can ask that fundamental question that I asked, which is how does the capacity of complexity of behavior scale as a function of resources as I pour more cells? What I mean by pour more cells is simulation world we can increase and what we find interestingly that the correlation length in these systems actually improves to a certain extent. There is a limit to how much we can do numerically. So we're starting to build uh, analytical models for these systems to really uh, ask a question of where there is a transition, because we do believe that after a certain number of cells, the systems becomes decoherent again. Uh, what we notice is actually multiple vortices can be supported in a system like this, and they start attracting, they start eating each other. And to give you a context of that, I'm now going to show you an experimental data, which is what you're looking on the left is instead of showing you all the cilia, this is still experimental data, I am just plotting the defect dynamics. So that bright little spot that you see is essentially the center of the vortex that's diffusing around. And I'm going to play that movie one more time. You see a fairly complex dynamics, and that was the transition from rotation to translation. But let's just play that one more time again, and you will see these higher modes of defects. You see these line defects, you see defects splitting, you see defects merging together, and uh, these are larger animals. And I think computationally, we have not been able to simulate these larger scale systems. Uh, the other thing that we can do, which many neuroscientists would appreciate, is we can ask a classical question in neuroscience, which is you want to build a controller that is both stable but also sensitive to inputs. And what I mean by sensitive to input is we can mechanically perturb every cell by pushing it and ask 
how does the entire system essentially uh, respond to that pull force? And we find this beautiful quadrant symmetry. We don't really have a very good explanation for this quadrant symmetry, but one thing that's important to notice here is that the peripheral cells are much more sensitive to force perturbations than to central cells. And you can imagine just purely from the geometry of the system that the periphery is much more sensitive to the kinds of forces that might be applied to the system. So the system is quite stable. It does lock in into a state, but it's quite sensitive in the fact that it can take input. And I'm not gonna talk too much about inputs today because I'm already at 45 minutes. Uh, let me just share one last movie and then I'm going to try to conclude, which is of course we can do uh, some much more complex dynamics in the system in which we can ask how do these vortices interact with each other? So what you just saw was how two spins either of the same chirality or different chirality will either attract or repel. And then of course we can do all of these types of experiments in the background of different kinds of information, including gradients. Uh, I want to conclude this part of this talk by saying uh, something quite simple, which many of you uh, would have appreciated, which is reminding uh, this beautiful work that was done uh, by Andy Runa and many people that followed his work afterwards of embodied computation. And this is a big field in robotics uh, where what you're watching, if you've never seen that video on the right, you're watching a mechanical robot walk and seemingly demonstrate a very uh, human-like walking gait. But surprisingly, there is absolutely no controller other than the mechanics itself. The springs and the weights of this system have been tuned such that literally this object is falling and in the dynamics of that, it actually recapitulates the dynamics of walking. And what we are interested in is understanding how in simple systems, the dynamics alone can give rise to baseline behavior. And for uh, the neuroscientists in the community, the reason we are interested in this is if we understand the underlying dynamics, we can then add complexity to it, which is chemical control. And the one kind of chemical control that we are interested in is neuropeptides, because neuropeptides can then interact with these cells and talk to this dynamical system to be able to control it in a manner. For example, how do you control this dynamical system to literally tell it to rip itself apart? You can imagine the kind of dynamics that is needed in the motility of walking cilia to rip itself apart but much of that has to be done in the context of being able to talk to this dynamical system. And I find that idea quite attractive in neuroscience because after all, uh, most neural systems are fundamentally dynamical systems that then you learn how to control over time. So that's all I'm going to say here. And on a philosophical note, uh, what this has led us uh, going back to uh, the classical ideas that I talked about at the origins of complexity. Uh, these types of computational and mathematical models have allowed us to ask really a strange question. Of course, none of us were there when multicellular life began. We can tease apart certain stories about what happened, but these mathematical and computational tools now allow us to build these virtual organisms and these virtual mathematical models to ask what class of parameters in the models suddenly explode the behavioral complexity. So rather than going bottom up, this is a top down approach. Often enough, we ask, how does coherent cell junctions or the strength of cell junctions will impart a certain property in a biological material? Here, we are taking a mathematical model and going the other way around to build what we call synthetic phylogenies. So the model that I showed you today is literally one of 30 or 40 different models that we've been building in systems like this to truly try to tease apart what is the phase space of complexity that exists in these very, very simple dynamical systems. Uh, and with that, I want to end this portion of the talk and I think probably the entire talk because there's only 10 minutes left and we should take some time for questions is uh, 
we're very interested in this type of a, a class of questions of uh, how biological systems are able to exploit mechanics to encode the true complexity that we see. And often enough, if we miss out on understanding these mechanical aspects of these biological systems, we truly cannot appreciate how the biochemistry controls this mechanics. So with that note, I'm going to conclude this part of the talk. And I think since I have run out of time and I want to spend some time for questions, uh, uh, if people are interested, uh, I can talk one or two word about frugal science. Uh, but why don't I yeah. end here? Uh, I want to end with this picture just as a, you know, kind of a joyful moment. Uh, of course, I uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about these abstract ideas, but most often the way that I satisfy my curiosity is taking these scientific tools and spending time in the field. Uh, but in parallel, we also spend a significant amount of time sharing these tools with a broader group of people. And there is a very large class of tools that we've been working on. Foldscope is the most well-known. Uh, if some of you are interested in the class of open source tools that we develop for uh, broader consumption, you can look at some of the papers in the past. Uh, but I want to end with this picture. I mean, of course, it's been almost uh, nine years since we released Foldscope. Uh, there is around a million of them around the world. This is what the map of those million Foldscopes look like. It gives me a lot of joy. Uh, that India happens to be the first place where there is true grassroots adoption of this technology. Uh, but I want to leave you with this picture, which is, you know, both a beautiful image for me personally and also a sad picture in the end. I mean, anybody who says kids can't be excited about science, I just show them this picture. I mean, I can hear the cacophony of excitement in this photograph, even though there is no sound associated with it. But on the other hand, I also think about, you know, we have a billion, two billion kids on this planet, and are we enabling them truly to engage in science that you and I, all of us who had a chance incident of exploring and seeing nature in its true form and learning how to ask questions, are we truly sharing that passion? Uh, and if so, how do you really bring uh, most of these kids that completely get lost and left out of the fold of science uh, back into, you know, go back to that classical uh, children's book that I talked about, Wonders of Nature? Because, you know, of course, to be a professional scientist uh, can be associated with a few handful of people, but to experience science, it is necessity and almost a right that all of us should have a chance to experience the wonders of science and nature. So with that note, I'm going to end. Uh, I wanna thank many of the students that I get a chance to work with. Uh, much of the work you heard on uh, the dynamics of fractures was with my postdoc Vivek Prakash. Uh, some of the talk that I work, I talked about the contractile wakes, waves was with uh, another postdoc, Shaha Furman, and then all the motility work and the theoretical underpinnings of the fracture dynamics and some of the theoretical underpinnings of the contractile wave dynamics is with my graduate student, Matt Stormbull. Uh, so with that note, I will end here and I can take questions. Uh, yeah, fantastic, Manu. Uh, very stimulating, uh, very thought provoking. Uh, so uh, uh, we have some questions uh, uh, in the chat box and also in the YouTube thing. So one of them is uh, the first one, uh, Professor KRS from the Engineering Mechanics Unit, is seeking the equivalence of uh, mechanical cues versus biological cues. Uh, <laughs> and um, is there a, a real uh, established correspondence uh, and the other thing is, uh, a general question is, uh, you are taking a deterministic sort of approach. I mean, you can increase the complexity, but finally, you know, you know the answer. So, 
but in a you know in a real biological world uh, i mean it's uh, it's a, that's a, it's a i mean a challenging thing so mm-hmm. that's yeah. a one the spirit of the question is that uh, and then the couple more i will read it out yeah i can just give very short answers that way we can take lots of questions so i think from a stochastics perspective we can include stochasticity in these types of models uh, based on Uh, the adhesion dynamics of the cilia to the substrate itself so that's one uh, one direction uh, i think what you asked about the equivalence of uh, cues the goal here is to not find an equivalent analogy uh, between uh, computation and mechanics the goal is slightly different the goal here is to understand how biology exploits dynamics and how biology exploits the limits of dynamical systems in a manner and actually keeps and builds controllers around them because interestingly uh you know any active system uh behaves in many ways and forms that there are layers of uh biochemical control that's built around it and that's the only way to exhibit a uh, patterned uh and uh a what you we would describe as an animal like behavior uh, rather than just a completely random dynamics or purely the dynamics of that system so what we're really interested in in these analogies is to try to strip the complexity and ask a layer of what is the underlying dynamics of this biological system but this is not a theoretical exercise we map it one to one to biological data so we can take motility dynamics of a an animal a real animal in a zero information environment and map it to the behavioral complexity that we see in our models and start building upon that to ask how many more knobs do i need to build before i can reach the complexity that i see in a real behaving animal okay so we had a couple of questions uh, in the chat box uh, i for some yeah so one is from professor ajay sood uh, i think maybe you answered the question but uh, he's asked what is the cause of activity is there any initiation of the activity uh, yes so, yeah yeah depending on different types of uh, systems but maybe in the ciliary system the cilia itself is essentially an oscillator so the cilia as many of you know has molecular motors inside and from a context of in a hydrodynamic perspective it can act like an oscillator effectively with a power stroke and a recovery stroke so it is beating at a constant frequency you can assume but what is interesting in our system is unlike in a hydrodynamic uh, in a fluid for example the frequency of beating is quite periodic we have a constraint because the organism is using the cilia to not swim but walk and it when there is a stall force associated with this that the cilia can be in a power stroke but because of geometrical confinement it can get stalled until a certain point where the tissue is pulled in a different direction and it can come out of the stall so this is really where the stochasticity comes from but the origin of activity is just ciliary beating so uh every one of the millions of cilia that i showed you in these pictures is essentially beating at 5 to 10 hertz so there were a couple of uh, general questions around uh, making uh, the equivalence to plants rather than animals i mean <laughs> rather than uh, so which are also neuron free but uh, they are a, it's a macroscopic system which uh, responds in the manner which uh, you are you have been alluding yeah. to Yeah no i think no plants are a great example i feel plants demonstrate incredible behavior just we as humans are so biased because we don't watch them on a time scale that they demonstrate behavior uh so that's a great analogy and primarily also from a mechanics perspective many of us know many plant behaviors are encoded in uh mechanics of uh you know turgor pressure in the cells uh, in the tension growth which is asymmetric yeah i mean that's a good example yeah. that's a good analogy uh, but again it is not that animals and metazoans and animal systems do not have that uh, underlying 
mechanical dynamics, uh, they they do that as well. And so it's kind of, you know, both of those are actually correct. Can you actually print out or can you fabricate cilia in the lab with all its uh, <laughs> micro uh, features? Yeah, I think there, there has been a lot of work in thinking about artificially making cilia, and it turns out uh, several people have succeeded. So there are examples of microfabricated cilia patterns. Uh, there are several groups that we have collaborated with who make these patterns and we give them certain theoretical uh, patterns uh, and then make a prediction. So it's it's actually fairly, it's it's feasible. Of course, it's a difficult experiment, but it's not completely out of question to literally build these uh, ciliary systems. Okay. Uh, I. Uh, yeah, so Professor Baskaran was asking, is there anything being vibrated or something in your driving thing? Or is it just static? I mean, your experiments, the videos which you showed, is it being oh, driven? Uh, yeah. yeah, all all the videos that I showed, uh, they're all driven. They are driven every particle you can imagine, essentially. And again, all the biological data I showed you is also all driven which is every single cell has one cilia. They're monociliated, and every one of those cilia is actually beating at a given frequency. So the drive is essentially coming from the beating of the cilia, and in our numerical simulations, we essentially have that same. There is a periodic force with a given frequency of the oscillator, except the frequency is coupled to the state of the cilia. So we actually model the stall dynamics. So there can be cilia that's beating at a certain frequency, but then if it reaches a stall force, it gets stalled until it pops out of it because it got tugged out of that stall because of a neighboring cilia. So okay. all of these systems are driven active systems. Yeah, so a couple of more short questions I'll read out to you. Uh, you have largely dealt with aquatic system. Have you dealt with uh, terrestrial where the environment is not aqueous? Then a colleague of mine, Rajesh, has asked a question. Is there a merit, re a merit in reclassifying living organisms in terms of computational ex ability they ex exhibit? Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll take the second one because that's a harder question uh, philosophically. Uh, I think it's a beautiful question. Is we often classify animals from the context of their origins, but it's valuable to also think about, you know, computational complexity has always been a very difficult subject, but most recently over the last five years, there are several techniques in physics in quantifying behavior and putting absolute numbers. So if I gave you 24 hour data sets for different animals, and without knowing any underlying dynamics, all you got to see is what that animal did. Could you classify those behaviors into categories? And that is starting to happen. And I feel there is a lot of value in it because then you're not biased. We often associate our own biases to these sets of systems. And actually, it's not clear to me what the limits of these systems are as yet. So, I mean, that's a beautiful thing. I, I don't think it has been done systematically. Of course, uh, many of these data sets are now available. Many of these tools are available. Uh, and then asking a question about terrestrial systems. You know, we study many different systems. I just ended up talking about one because I thought it would be fun to spend time on one. I was hoping to talk about multiple. One uh, terrestrial system that we have studied in a dynamical system perspective is essentially we have studied uh, a two-dimensional, we call it two-dimensional flight, which is a flight of a beetle, which is an insect that instead of flying in three dimensions, only flies on a surface of water. And okay. you can see the oscillator in that system is the wing beats, uh, and it becomes a very nonlinear system primarily because it's being tugged by surface tension. Uh, so there are several other terrestrial systems that we work on, uh, but you know I think you know, often enough I'm gravitated towards smaller and smaller systems. Yeah, 
So there is one interesting question uh, related to the neuron analogy. Uh, uh, you have these non, uh, non-Newtonian uh, properties of it integrate stimuli over time which can act as memory you know mm-hmm. is there an yes. equivalence out here yeah and you know i i know ajay is ajay is on the call so i'm sure many people have thought about encoding memory in uh abiotic systems and i think it's a fascinating field primarily because we're learning quite a lot uh as yet we are yet to find evidences of memory in this system but we are currently running a class of experiments to try to tease apart if we if the system has the capacity to encode memory and what is the cognitive capacity of a system like this there are very classical tools in biology that have been developed to build those types of analogies uh i think in some of our other work we explore and think about memory uh but in this system uh the way you should think about uh, separation of time scales is that there is a time scale associated with the ciliary beat frequency. And then there is another time scale associated with the elastic dynamics. And of course, the you can pump energy from the fast time scales to the system that is on the flow time scales, which is the elasticity. And that that energy can be pumped back into the cilia because after a certain increase in the density fluctuation in a given portion of the tissue, it will eventually relax and it will pump that energy back into the cilia. So it's, I mean, that is not encoding memory. It just is linking two different time scales. Uh, but it, that's a fascinating question. We as yet don't yeah. have any evidence of memory in these systems. Okay, so I I realize that it's getting very late in Palo Alto, so I I will uh, leave you. But there are if you get the time, uh, I think these questions uh, may be available later on also. There are a couple of students who have been uh, asking some very fundamental questions about neuro the field of neuro robotics and pendulum theory neuromechanics. I mean I think you can uh, answer them separately. There yeah. were, uh, How do uh, I get access? Center, so I'm yep. sure they will uh, contact you. And okay. uh, this uh, YouTube also has got comments. Uh, there was quite a number of participants, uh, more than 100 on YouTube live, uh, 125. And uh, okay. so you will find some questions there also. So Uma Shankar uh, uh, has written that tendrils in plants are a good example of a neural behavioral pattern. Hopefully, uh-huh. Professor Prakash might want to reflect about this sometime as a good model system. Yeah. yeah, no, I so, think uh, we, we don't give credit to plants as much as we should. Uh, I am biased yeah. on that as well. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think uh, it's been really stimulating for us uh, out here. And um, I hope you had a good time talking to us. And um, uh, we will, I, I'm sure people will get back to you through various forums and uh, uh, have some more, uh, you know, uh, links uh, developed over the coming years. And also the other aspect which you, uh, you didn't unfortunately have the time to elaborate, the social, the outreach related to your uh, experimental science. It's something uh, many of us are really interested in and uh, want to really scale up. Um, and it's like a crowd science. I, th- I think it's got a very great future uh, and it would be something yeah, that, I think I was I was debating that would have been a completely different talk. So I think I yeah. <laughs> uh, I hope to interact with all of you, and especially yeah. my hope is that uh, as a society at large, because you link many aspects of Indian science, uh, I yeah. would be very excited about being able to make sure that we can uh, do these types of experiments at large scale. I mean, literally, there are. Uh, you know, 50 to 100,000 kids all across India that explore the biological and the natural world using these simple tools. How do we provide mentorship to them? How do we engage with them? How do we follow their journey of science and support them? No matter of any academic institution, no matter what the uh, academic viability of their ideas might be, but just purely support their curiosity. And I think We can't do that alone. Tools are not enough. Mentors are extremely important. 
And so it would be phenomenal if some of you at the society have interest in thinking about how do we expand that uh, to make sure that, you know, all of us have to give back. There is no other choice. Otherwise, we would find a society that would not even trust science. So it is in our mutual benefit and the benefit of the planet to make sure that we could do this. I would love to explore how that could be scaled up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. You know, so it's been great. And I should uh, tell the audience, uh, I'm, I should apologize to many of them that have been not been able to put their questions across uh, yeah, due to lack of time. But uh, I'm sure uh, whenever uh, Manu gets the chance, uh, he can, uh, I mean, reply to you. Leisure, we have copied the question, so I will pass it on to him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I will leave you, and uh, thanks again. It was good having you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, we will see yeah. each other some other time soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Sure. Bye. Yeah.